Matt here from Matt's Movies Music and More and my special guest Andrew welcoming you to this week's episode of What Did You Think? So if you saw our last episode of What Did You Think? You'll know that the Twister Spinner had picked from the WTF category which was the Greasy Strangler. Fun times. I can tell, I can tell. And to replace w, that movie in the WTF category we've put in there the 1988 apocalyptic movie Miracle Mile, which is a film that stars Anthony Edwards and Mayor Winningham. Okay, that'll be interesting. Okay, and so for today's movie, Twister Spinner had picked at the end of the episode from the family category, so something upbeat, yeah? After last movie, I'd be very um, grateful for that, yes. Yes, so to replace this movie on the Twister Spinner, um, we have put in there the 1970 live-action animated movie, The Phantom Tollbooth, which is a film that what? stars, yeah, it's a movie that stars Butch Patrick, who was famous for playing Eddie Munster in the 60s TV series The Munsters. Uh, it's a movie I've always wanted to see, and when we get into the episode I'll explain a bit more about why I picked okay, it. Okay, I, I see you're looking forward to it at me, so that should be good. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. So on to today's movie. So today we've gone with a real classic, which is actually 20 years old this year. And it's a movie that more people need to talk about, in my opinion, and so we're going to get on to it. So we're going to be talking about the 1999 classic, The Iron Giant, which you, is... You promised something upbeat. Yeah. I want my money back. <laughs> oh, wait, no, I didn't pay you. No. Right, so The Iron Giant is directed by Brad Bird, and it stars as the vocal talents of Jennifer Aniston... Harry Connick Jr., Christopher McDonald, Eli Marenthal, and yeah. Vin Diesel as the Iron Giant. Yeah. So, the Iron Giant, had you seen it before it came up on the Twister Spence? It's all it's one of those movies like I'm probably many people as we'll get into that um, I was aware of it. Um, I just didn't think to um, give this a look back in the day. I think that was something to do with the way it was promoted, which again we'll get into, but completely passed me by and years later I keep hearing people saying about how it is the very epitome of an underappreciated classic. Oh, you should see this. Oh, this is a wonderful movie that everybody should see. So it has piqued my curiosity for a very, very long time. Yeah. So um, I'll, I'll explain about where I discovered it at the end of this video, but um, oh, I, I, I think it's best for us to get into the plot, if that's okay. Okay, um, it, it's um, in Maine, a small little town in Maine during 1950s America. Um, we have a boy, uh, Hogarth Hughes, named after the original author of this um British novel, Ted Hughes, but forget all that, this is America, America, in every sense of the word here, America, Cold War, um, instructional videos to the school children about, when there's the dirty reds, there's the threat of nuclear holocaust, and, but don't worry, all you have to do is duck and cover and you'll be safe. Um, his, uh, yeah, Hogarth's a boy, his um, single mother works as a waitress at the diner. Um, he wants, um, he's a bit of an outsider. Um, he wants a pet, but his mum's always going, no, no, it'd be too much of a hassle, it'll get dirty. Um, one night, um, as he's waiting for his mum to come back from the uh, diner, um, something hits the antenna. There's some disturbance outside and um, in this dark and stormy night because of course dark stormy night um, he discovers a great big metal giant this monosyllabic I don't know he doesn't even have dialogue at this point um, he seems to have a bump in his head and he's going around munching anything that's metal and uh, this leads him to get tangled up in a bunch of um, electrical wires and he's in pain and uh, he's a little scared at first because great big metal, this must be some kind of monster, right? But he sees that this is a creature in pain so he helps disconnect the power and untangle the wires and they 
Um, well, first he tries to tell his mum, but of course his mother doesn't believe him. Um, but he sees that the um, giant mon uh, metal monster is still there the next morning and decides to try and befriend it and uh, talk with it and, um, and basically hide it. And he is going to have to hide it because um, the US government have sent some lackey over, Kent Mansley, who um, there's been, been reports of half-torn, half-eaten metal uh, cars and uh, uh, things everywhere. Uh, which he initially dismisses at first, but the more evidence he uncovers, the more he thinks that there is something out there. And obviously, that this is, if there's a line of dialogue in the movie about if we didn't make it, then clearly it's a, something to be worried about. Clearly, it's against us, and we have to just find it and destroy it. So the boy, as well as teaching the robot about humanity and finding out, hopefully, finding out where this creature came from, uh, the bigger worry is having to hide it. But how long can he conceivably do this? And what will happen? Mm. It's an interesting movie, this, because, um, as, as I said earlier, um, the way I discovered this film was, I think, around the time of its release, actually, in 1999, when um, it had been released in the UK, and um, it came out I think late 1999, early 2000 and this was the early days of DVD and yeah. um, I think a family friend had picked up the DVD of it from America because it was released in America on DVD before it came out in the UK theatrically yeah. and I watched it and they said oh you've got to see this movie, it's really really good and I watched it and I was like yeah I can see why this is a movie that a lot of people are fond of and um, the animation is great. I think Warner Brothers Animation Studio did a great job, and it's something that I, I'm so sad about that they didn't, they didn't really do very much now. I mean, the only sort of division of Warner Brothers Animation Studios now is the DC animated movies, which are fantastic. They do a really good yeah. job with that. But besides those sort of movies, they haven't really ventured into doing Le more Lego like Lego that. movie. But is that done by Warner's Animation Studio rather than another subsidiary company? Um, well, Warner's Animation is a uh, Storks. Okay. That's all. Uh, that yeah, that is all I can think of okay. right now. Right. Well, what's interesting about the movie to me is the people involved in the film and. I know that we're going off topic of the film itself, but I'd like to talk about them people first, which yeah. is, um, we're going to start off with Brad Bird. Now, Brad Bird, to those of you out there who know who he is, he is a filmmaker and director who got his big break. Did he work on The Simpsons? He, I've read this, he was on, uh, the one thing on The Simpsons they particularly single him out for is um, Krusty Gets Busted, the very earlier episode where he got framed for robbery and uh, Sideshow Bob first came out as a villain. Yeah, and um, obviously um, he wanted to try and get into doing um, this type of movie. And um, I think he did a great job with the film, I think. Um, and obviously Brad's now gone on to do bigger and better things for Disney with The Incredibles and its sequel, The Incredibles 2 and Tomorrowland. Which is what I wanted to get to, which is that in order to do my preparation for re-watching re this film for the first time in a number of years, because I don't think I'd seen it for about 10 years, I recently watched the Blu-ray edition, which is the signature edition of this film, which is the one you can buy in the shops or whatever on Blu-ray and DVD. And um, in that film, I watched the signature edition cut there's a slightly different cut if you get the Blu-ray or DVD to the original theatrical version. And it is, there's a scene where Hogarth is watching television, I think, in the living room. And he's trying to hide the Iron Giant from Kent Mansley, who's in the, in the house. He's, he's staying there. He's, like rent, he's, he's renting the apartment. He's on the case. He's yeah. giving the boy shifty looks all the time. Yeah. And a trailer comes on on the television advertising Tomorrowland. Apparently that was Brad Bird's first choice to have that advertised in the film. But because Disney refused at the time, 
uh, it's do, back in 1999. You, you don't work for us. Yeah. yeah. They decided that that scene couldn't be in the film. And now the signature edition's out, and the fact that Brad Bird directed Tomorrowland, yeah. it's now allowed to be put back in the movie. Fair enough. And I think that's good. Even though it doesn't really add too much to the scene, yeah, but I thought it was quite interesting to does, say. It doesn't help Tomorrowland be that any great of a movie, but never mind. No. <laughs> On to the actors, I guess, which is that um, we'll start off with Eli Marantfell, who plays Hogarth Hughes. The, the boy. Yeah. Did you know that in 1999, when this movie came out, he was in another movie which also celebrates its 20th anniversary this year, American Pie. Clearly this was a big year for him. Maybe. Yeah, and do you know who he played in American Pie? Um, what? Stifler's younger brother. So when they're watching Nadia on the webcam scene, he's there and he's like, hey, I want to use my laptop, but I'm going to tell mum. And then all of a sudden he's like, this is the coolest thing I've ever seen. So that's, that's Eli Moranthal. Right. And um, what do you think of Pogar as, as the voice and the character? I think he's brilliant. Well, um, so his, his voice certainly helps uh, sell it, and do pardon me, I do apologise, this is another one of those episodes where I'm going to have to get this out for reference. But um, you think of kids, you think of kids in 90s movies, what do you think? You think of um, someone who's spiky-haired or has an attitude because it's the 90s, someone who's a rebel or um, either a, a cool rebel or someone who's uh, squeaky voiced or annoying. Hogarth is none of these things. He is an average kid. He's, he's good, he's good hearted, you know, he's um, trying to teach the Iron Giant about um, humanity, about, um, he shows in the comics about, um, oh, and he first identifies with the metal monster, but no, no, I think of you, you're like Superman. Uh, Superman didn't start out great uh, as anything, but um, he came here as a stranger. And, that, and uh, another conversation I could, you know, how souls don't die, how um, you're not a gun, you're, you are who you choose to be. That's, that's Hogarth leading that he, he is the conscience and yet he's he's reckless as he as well but he's also all right he succeeds in being our identification figure we see the iron giant we see all the other kids paranoia about duck and cover and i think there's another kid that says whatever it is it's a monster so we need to blow it up yeah and hogarth's reactions to that no. I, I think it's a good performance. Um, Vin Diesel. Now, Vin Diesel, um, a year or two before this, had done Saving Pirate Ryan, so he wasn't the huge household name that he is now. Um, what do you think of his performance as the voice? Well, it's always tempting to say that um, there's not much of a performance when there's only like a few words that he ever manages to um, utter, but it's kind of what you do with those words, isn't it? Um, I mean, Superman, how often does that get people in the um, uh, tug at the heartstrings? How, whenever he speaks, how do you feel this overwhelming sense of empathy and pity and um, it's got that sort of compassion thing. I, I, I don't know if it was artificially twiddled with, but it works. It does, and you can see why why Vin Diesel is very successful as Groot in yeah, the Guardians of the Galaxy it's movie. It's funny to look at this with hindsight now, isn't it? Yes. Because obviously after this, Vin Diesel's career blew straight up with the Fast and Furious and the Triple X movies. So, yeah. You know, this really was a help for him. Um, regarding the supporting actors in this movie. Um, Jennifer Aniston, who recently um, was still, she was still in Friends at the time, but she had been successfully doing movies here and there, Picture Perfect, Object yeah. to My Affection, and Office Space, to name a few. Yeah. And um, in this is Annie, I think, you know, she's a likeable character. She clearly is a, a caring mother who's doing all she can to help raise Hogarth and look after them, because obviously she's a single mother. The no mention is there The about struggling that. single mother, but... Bon uh, bonus points for making a song and dance about, well, where's the dad then? 
Yeah. In a, I suppose it's sort of touched on in this whole souls don't die conversation, but if they don't whack you over their head with it about, oh, he was neglectful or, oh, he, he ran away or something, which I'm, I'm very grateful to this movie for. There's a lot I'm grateful to this movie for, but I'll, I'll go into that. And then what about the beatnik Dean, played by Harry Connick Jr.? I think he is an interesting character. Yeah. I mean, it's sort of part of that 50s um, setting, isn't it? You've already got the Cold War nuclear paranoia um, in, the, in the setting. You've got the whole um, sci-fi space monsters on the telly, which clearly is um, then reflected in the Iron Giant. But you've got the um, regimented military culture, and then you've got opposing as a direct counterpoint to this, of course you've got the beatnik as the sympathetic Who figure. owns a junkyard which is handy for the Iron Giant. It's a great as a plot point, you need to hide the giant somewhere at some point and whoever you've got to help you out, you would um, um, come attached to this. But he's also an artist as well, so he makes things out of the junk as well. Yeah. So that's also quite cool as well, but he's a nice character and clearly there's the romantic bond between himself and Annie and also he, yeah. he, he has a lot of mutual admiration and respect I guess for Hogarth as well, right? Yes. And then obviously the final character that we want to talk about is um, Shooter McGavin, sorry, Kent Mansley, uh, played by Christopher McDonald. I've heard a, lo a, a couple of people say, it, it, I, don't, I don't know who this is, but it, it's Shooter McGavin. Right. Shooter McGavin is a character that Christopher McDonald played in Happy Gilmore, the Adam Sandler movie, which is my favourite of his performances. And um, having him as Kent Mansley, who's this kind of weaseling kind of FBI agent who's trying to sort of find out what's going on, and he'll do anything to betray people, even if it's like, I'll make you a promise, you, you um, tell me and we'll cut a deal or whatever, when clearly he's going to go back on his word. And um, I thought he was really good in the film as well. I don't know what your opinion is. Oh, that. yeah, he's, he's great as the villain, as the um, antithesis of peace and um, understanding that this, that, that this movie is trying to uh, convey, as well as um, the, uh, the his, his increasing tension and paranoia. And it, he does a great job of play of doing the whole panicked, angry, um, instinctive gut reaction, um, shout, um, shouty stuff at the climax. Mm. Now, I want to touch on this briefly without spoiling too much, but there's a scene in this movie which you probably know which one I'm going to talk about. Would you say it's very much influenced by Disney and Bambi in particular? Um... Influenced as um, that they uh, put this in there because they know that it's a tear-jerking moment, which also has a moral to the story, which is that the Iron Giant essentially is is a mach is a weapon. That's what he essentially is, and he's controlled by anger and rage and stuff like that. Whereas when well, he's, he's supposed to be, yeah. Whereas when he's, he's got a malfunction in his robot yeah. brain, yeah. But when whereas when he's um, nice and sweet and innocent or whatever. He sees like a deer in the woods and he's like, oh, look at that. And he's like, sort of puts his finger out, lets the deer sniff, and then the deer sort of runs away a little bit. And then he's like, he wants to go and see where the deer has gone. And all of a sudden, you hear this sound of guns and the deer is dead. And it's such a sad scene because, you know, he, he, it's the first time he's seen death in these eyes, I'd say, in these, in these innocent eyes rather than his weaponized mode. Well, on it. Um, in the context of the movie, I'll be out outside. I'm thinking outside the context of the uh, movie of the story. I'm, I'm, it's an it's a necessary um, plot device, but I'm thinking more a reaction to Disney. I imagine it would be because do you remember at this time, 1999, this was the Disney Renaissance. They were at the height of their powers, so. Any, anything that any other studio animation animation studio did would have been a reaction mm. to Disney. Mm. 
And given that this is a a animated movie rather than a computer animated movie like Disney were putting out at the time with Toy Stories and their other Pixar films, yeah. um, this this does look very different and um, it, it's beautifully shot. It looks great. Yeah. And even on the Blu-ray, it looks fantastic too. It's um funny how this was like the last gasp of um, 2D animation. It's often held up as the last great 2D animated movie and um, at looking back with um, hindsight with um, the likes of this and uh, Titan AE and um, Atlantis the Lost Empire Another I look, Disney I one, look yeah, at this yeah. and think yes it was it's funny how everything sort of culminated to produce like this and yet nobody was paying attention at the time because I think um, Toy Story had come out and that was the bee's knees and everyone wanted more of that. Yeah, it seemed like this sort of animation was, was disappearing really, really. But you look at this and you see that you see, um, think, um, you think of things like the, the opening nighttime forest sequence and you think that, yeah, this was very well staged and um, choreographed and um, they clearly put a lot of care and thought into how everything would be uh, framed mm -hmm. with, with half the budget of a typical Disney movie, I believe. Well, it's still relatively a big budget. I mean, um, it, this was a big budget film. I think it was about $70 million or whatever, but it took nowhere near that money in the box office, about $30 million. But this was clearly a, a movie which, in video and D well DVD rentals, this would have been one of the big DVD rentals and purchases, I reckon, of 2000. I, did, 2000. I did read somewhere that um, Warner Brothers didn't put that much marketing into the theatrical release. And, as soon as, and when they saw what buzz it was getting, it was already too late. So they tried to make up for it. Do you think that, sales. That, that timing and maybe the fact that there may have been other movies, i.e. the American Pie movies, the fact that this was a summer release, do you think that it wouldn't have had a chance against American Pie, which was the, the global phenomenon of 1999, I'd say. Well, Along with The Matrix, obviously, which came a bit earlier. The Matrix, so that is a valid theory, yes. Yeah, because obviously, you look at this movie and you kind of think, who would go and see it? It's not really got, it hasn't got named actors on the poster, it's just, no. it says The Iron Giant, and it's just this beautiful imagery I've seen of the, of the shadow of The Iron Giant, I think I saw on the DVD. Uh, from America, the UK DVD had different cover art, and now the new Blu-ray, which is out, the signature one, it's got this beautiful artwork as well. Um, but I think it's a fantastic movie. I think it's very underrated, and a lot of people should go and see it, mm. especially if you like the other Brad Bird movies, The Incredibles, Incredibles 2, and um, Tomorrowland, which I haven't seen in Tomorrowland or Incredibles 2, but um, I love The Incredibles. I thought that's a great yeah. movie. Now, well, taking taking all this into context, The Incredibles, Tomorrowland, and uh, it's probably obvious to everyone, but I think it bears repeating out loud. Brad Bird sure loves his fifties America iconography, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. Do you think that from its ending, which we're not going to spoil at no, all, no. do you think that this movie should have and could have potentially had a sequel within? The first five years of this so release. The first five years of its release, um, that would have been enough time for it. But the question is, how? Um, what do you make of a sequel out of this? I mean, Ted Hughes did the book. Uh, Ted, what the the Iron Woman was that his next one? Okay. Do you make something out of that? Okay. Um, I almost what I, I see what you mean. I, I, it, they somehow turned the original Ted Hughes novel and made a great 50s American children's story out of this. So I don't want to say you couldn't make a sequel out of this. If the imagination is there, I'd be interested to see. But I almost want to say that the ending of this movie is poignant and sweet enough in itself that any kind of follow-up could threaten to cheapen it. Agree. I think that um, it doesn't need a sequel. I think mm. if any studio tries to do it now I just don't think it's right I uh, even if a remake came along I just think why it's not needed this is a perfect movie the way it is 
and apparently a film that still gets theatrical runs here and there in the United States and does very, yeah. very well. I heard the one little fun fact that um, made me smile is that um, in, in America at least, uh, TNT and Cartoon Network purchased the television screening rights okay. and because of this, I don't know if they do it now, but back then they would do, on Thanksgiving I think, 24 hour marathon run the Iron Giant all day. Cool. Which sounds, sounds like, yes, that's how you get an audience for this. That's how you appreciate what a great movie this is. And do you think it deserves to be compared to these early Disney classics, like I said, with Bambi and the early, you know, the ones that have the morals with them, you know, and, the, you know, with when bad things happen, we learn from the mistakes and, you know, we learn to become better people because of it. Well, it's great that um, a movie had a message like that um, as late as the 90s. Uh, as a, someone watching this now with the hindsight of what cut, of what animated movies are, wacky faces, um, weird mouths, pop culture references, pop culture songs, I went to see Angry Birds 2 last week. Really? When I think of Angry Birds 2, not horrible, but when I think of Angry Birds 2 running in slow motion and um, we have to initiate Plan X. Oh, I'm sorry, I thought you said spandex. <laughs> and then right said Fred, I'm too sexy for my shirt, starts playing. <laughs> when I think of that and then I think of this, this movie... I, where did we go wrong? Yeah. What what happened to us? This is the last, among the la last gasp of cartoons that is content to be a proper movie with a proper story of a narrative. It's told straight. It's a heart-wrenching story of a boy teaching humanity to a big, giant monster that just happens to be a cartoon. And you've been... It, you could one of those movies that you could forget is a cartoon because the characters and the performances are just that compelling. It would have been great to have seen this movie potentially be nominated for a best animated feature in the Oscars of that year. Well, some, some kind of recognition, but, but clearly it would have been overshadowed by Disney anyway. Uh, yeah, what, what what came out? I, I want I want to say. I'm gonna guess Toy what, Story two maybe. Well, 1999, 2000, 2000. probably. Yeah. But if that's or the, Shrek, even. Yeah. In both those cases, I almost want to say, fair enough, those were good movies, but I can't help but feel this. Yeah, I, I'm going to join the club of this should have got proper advertising and in marketing at the time. Shame on you, Warner Brothers. Mm. Well, now they're learning from their mistake by cashing in on it. And, uh, and putting the Iron Giant into Ready Player One. Yeah, and seeing also Superman, another Marvel, uh, Warner Brothers uh, property put into the film as well, with the Iron Giant displaying a big S on his big chest. Big S, and like we said, Superman yeah. plays a, is a great significance at the end. Yes. So I, I had a blast uh, rechecking this out. I am glad that I finally got to see what the... Uh, is all about. And I bet you're thinking, shame on me for not seeing it sooner. A little, but how old was I? I'm sure my mind was on teenage stuff. Well, you know what did come out in 99, which we did forget to mention, which might have also stopped it? South Park, bigger, longer and uncut. Yeah, I, I went to see that at the cinema. Yeah. I didn't see Iron Giant, but no. you know what? I went with a friend and we had a damn good laugh at uh, Shut Your Effing Face, Uncle Effo, and boy, was, I want to say it was worth it. <laughs> so, yeah, so that was the So, Iron so you totally, uh, totally um, give this a chance. Um, it's a brisk runtime of 87 minutes. It's not going to take up too much of your time. Please, just go ahead. So yeah, so that's the Iron Giant. And yeah, I too. Just yeah, to spend the time. Okay then, let's give let's it. see. Without further ado, let's spin that wheel. Sure. Ah, it's landed on sci-fi. 
Oh, okay. Good. Let's see what we've Very got. Good. We have got another movie which celebrates its 20th anniversary this year and is one that probably a lot of people are talking about at the moment. Yeah. I suppose. Episode 1, Phantom Menace. Oh, screw this for a game of soldiers. I'm joking. It's The Matrix. Oh. And as we do this, we have just recently found out that they are planning on doing the fourth in the Matrix series. Oh, screw my donkey. So, yeah, so um, hopefully uh, we will join you, you join us on the so, next episode. No, so, so, so we're sticking in the year of 1999 for the time being. Yeah. We're going to oh, party yeah. like it's 1999 in this channel. Again. Yes. So, um, yeah, what did you guys think of The Iron Giant? Is it something that you guys have seen? Have you not seen it? Check it out if you haven't. It's a great mm -hmm. film. Um, Thanks for checking out our video today. Um, don't forget to check out Andrew's series on this channel at the Movies of Andrew. I've got my own solo videos. We have um, numerous other videos that could be coming up on this channel soon. And um, without further ado, thank you very much, everybody. Andrew, closing statement. Screw this country. I want to live. <laughs> thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.